have Olga and Lauren here today talking about working from home and helping your kids facilitate, or I guess facilitating distance learning with your children. Um, Olga and Lauren are teachers at Wheeler Middle School, school who have worked closely over the last three years. They serve as grade level mentors for their seventh grade team. Olga teaches English, language, arts, and social studies. Lauren teaches math and science. As team teachers, they deliver rigorous content that is meaningful to their students. They promote an inquiry-based approach and ignite curiosity to transform students into active explorers. Thank you both so much for being here. I'm really excited to hear your guys' perspective and help our members and community thrive while they work from home and also help their children. Thank you for having us. We're super excited. It's a hot topic right now, so we're uh, very eager to talk about some of the things that helped us be successful. Yeah, thank you so much, Amy. We're excited to be here and we hope that we can help out. Um, I'm going to start by sharing my screen um, so that you guys can kind of see the um, slides that we have prepared. And then we'll hop in. All right, Olga, can you see those? I do. I see everything. Perfect. Um, all right, so uh, just like Amy said, we're going to be going over uh, kind of best ways to navigate distance learning from home for your kids um, while you're also uh, likely trying to work from home. So uh, we totally understand that it can be uh, challenging at this moment, and we just want to let you know um, a few tips and tricks to hopefully make it as positive of an experience as we can. So um, a little bit about us. Amy just went over pretty much everything, um, but uh, my name is Lauren Tanner and I am a seventh grade teacher at Wheeler Middle School um, up at the Army base in Wahua. And this is my amazing teaching partner, Olga. Hi everyone. Yep, I'm also um, on school field with Lauren. Uh, we're team teachers, so we share the same group of kids, except we just teach different subjects. Yes, so um, we've worked closely together for the last three years um, at the school. And um, we have been doing a lot of initiatives trying to um, kind of push this distance learning with our own kids and with their families. Um, and then also just wanted to reach out to community in any way that we can help. So uh, we are teachers and we have kind of learned how to navigate the classroom and want to help you learn how to navigate your homes with those same skills that we have learned and hopefully you'll find beneficial. Um, so uh, we have kind of three main objectives or points that um, by the end of this presentation, hopefully you'll walk away feeling confident in. Uh, the first one is how to create a structure for your daily routine. Uh, second one is how to be efficient and effective with your days. And the third one is how to create a positive environment at home. Um, during this <laughs> challenging time uh, where you're spending a lot more time at home than normal and maybe with a lot more people than normal, uh, all crammed into your home. We're trying to make it as positive of an experience as possible. So we kind of started off with this quote um, and we wanted you guys to, to realize balance is not something you find, it's something you create. So as we do enter this new time of distance learning and working from home and who knows how long we're gonna be in this situation for, um, we wanna be sure that it's not just something you're sitting back and just accepting the situation that you're in, but you're actively trying to create it into a positive situation where everyone is productive. And I'm gonna throw it over to Olga to go over our agenda. Perfect. So um, we're a little bit ahead of, of the schedule, but um, we did go over the intro and the objectives, but basically we're gonna break it down into three pieces. The first objective, the second objective, and then the third. We're gonna leave some time for a question and answer, and of course, we'll um, address questions at the same time. Um, we don't, we're, since we're doing this for a recording as well, that might come better a little bit at the end. Um, and then we're gonna do a little bit of a sneak peek for our initiative called Spark and Inspire. It's a project that we're doing with this. Nope, and we might have had okay. Olga please. There we go, Olga, we lost you for a second. Oh, great. Thank Spark you. And inspire. Um, Spark and Inspire. Awesome. So we have the great initiative that we've created. It's very innovative and it basically bridges the community with our school stakeholders um, so that we can create positive change across Hawaii. Um, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. I think we're going to jump into the very first objective. Yeah. So um, in order to effectively facilitate distance learning from home while also working from home, we feel like there's four um, key components. So one is structure, structure, structure. So we're gonna kind of give some ideas on that, including workspaces, schedules, certain structures you could have in place at your home. 
second, once you have those structures, you need to have a flow. So some way that this is sustainable um, and it keeps going and it, it builds onto that routine. So that includes breaks, check-ins, and of course, positivity, like we already talked about. Um, and all of those things should lead to results. Um, so deliverables, artifacts, and feeling like you have progress. Um, you don't want to be sitting at home, you know, like a week, like a spring break can feel ooh, like this is kind of nice to relax. But when we're looking at this much time at home, you want to be sure you're still fueling your body with um, results and then leading into rewards. So incentives to keep all of these good habits. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started on the first one. And I'm going to start off, uh, off with the first two and then Olga's going to jump in for the last two. So the first one is structure. Structure is essential for everyone. Without it, uh, we cannot be successful, whether you're a child or an adult. Um, at any phase of life, you need structure in order to thrive and in order to get any work done. Um, so the first part that we wanted to highlight is workspace. Um, so all adults and children in your household need to have some sort of workspace that does feel like their own, something that they feel excited about, something they feel proud to work in, and it needs to be a space where only work is done. Um, we realize space can be really limited, especially here in Hawaii. Um, so you want to be sure that you create kind of a, even if you have to sort of make a fake space where it's just where you're working. So maybe you have up a little folder, you have a sign that says like working at this table. Um, maybe like make little name plates so that each kid feels like they have their own desk area or work area. Um, and parents should have that same space too. And that way you're not dealing with the irritations and you know like, okay, when mom or dad are in this workspace, they, they cannot be bothered. Or when your kids are in their workspace, they know that they're being productive. Even if it's all in there together, like some of these images, each person, person has their space and that space is a sacred and safe space to them. Um, so be sure that everyone in your family feels proud. Maybe let the kids set it up, decorate their own space, um, and reminders to just keep it clean, like you would want to do with any actual workspace. Keep it clean, as clutter-free as possible, just to keep everybody's sanity uh, during this time. All right. And for our next one, it's just talking a little bit more about routine. So once you have your workspace carved out, you want to instill that routine and be sure that you're sticking to it every day. So you want to decide on a daily routine. And that routine, like the, the items might look different each day, but the routine looks the same. So the daily routine together as a family. So maybe you start off each day doing something together. Maybe you eat all of your meals together and you have certain work times that you stick to. What you're doing during those work times may differ, but the times are always the same. Kids are very used to structure, especially at school. You know, you have school bells and you have a schedule you stick to and the kids really thrive on it. So you wanna be sure you decide on it together, you stick to it, and that you're checking in on each other for support. Um, well, again, I kind of thought of this little bit of a metaphor. Uh, your family is your team right now, and each member has a different responsibility and a different role, and each one needs to fulf be fulfilled, uh, kind of like a puzzle piece now coming together to form the greater puzzle. Um, so each member needs to feel valued, um, but also each member needs to be held responsible for all of their duties. And kind of going into the last part of this is once you have the space and once you have your routine, you need to have a plan for each day. So maybe you're coming up with that the night before as a family for the next day. Maybe each person is coming up with their own daily plan as far as what needs to get done. But all adults and children in your house need to know what they're going to get done on a certain day. Otherwise, none of it's going to get accomplished and you're going to start feeling like, oh, this is crazy, I'm feeling so bored. You're gonna start having the irritations and all the negative thoughts that come with that. Um, be sure you have something that's a joint effort. So as a family unit, you wanna have some joint family goals. So not just individual lists, but also some things you do together. Um, we suggest, and I think a lot of you might would agree, uh, something to get the family moving would be a really good idea. So maybe starting together with a fitness goal, um, Olga and I have been pushing that out in our classroom and we've had some hilarious responses from parents as far as like, oh, I tried to do 50 burpees with my son today. We couldn't get through it. So we stopped at 30 and he wanted me to let you know, like he was worried he didn't complete the 50. 
um, but they're having a great time moving together and it's something that the family is all doing together and then they can split off and do their individual work tasks. Um, next is three kind of main takeaways. So uh, one, you wanna stick to your normal routines for bedtimes and meal times, especially for younger kids. Um, something we've been seeing as teachers, uh, we uh, teach middle schoolers, so teens, and uh, we set our office hours for 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. And we have kids complaining that it's so early and that they're sleeping through them. And we just wanna kind of instill from a teacher standpoint, we think that kids should be still waking up at a normal time for school um, and going to sleep at a normal time for school. And there's so many health benefits for that, but also just keeping that routine is really good for the mental headspace. Um, same for meal time. So hopefully you can all sit down and eat meals together at a certain time and maybe you can find something that works for everybody. But even if not, maybe realizing what time your child normally eats lunch, for example, at their school and sticking to that uh, is super beneficial for kids, especially teens. Uh, try not to have the news on while kids are in the room. Um, students become really overwhelmed by what's going on in the world, especially I would say middle school and younger who may have trouble fully comprehending what's going on. I mean, we have trouble fully comprehending what's going on um, and it can be overwhelming. And with all this time together, I know adults wanna hear the news and get the news, um, but just be mindful of how much of that the kids are actually seeing and absorbing. Uh, and to keep screen time as positive and helpful as possible. I feel like in a normal setting and in our normal lives, we kind of have our daily routines that we're going, 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 and then maybe kids will jump on to TV time or game time or video games or whatever as a way of entertainment. And it's almost flipped now. Since they're having to spend so much time on technology and same for us adults, um, when we're having those breaks or wanting to relax, I think it's best to keep that screen time as minimal as possible and try to get outside, go for a walk, go for a run, go for a bike ride, um, play cards, draw, do something creative, um, trying to just be mindful about how much time you're spending on the screens um, so that they're not spending, you know, 12 to 18 hours a day on screen. Um, we have linked some resources here um, that you'll be able to access. So the first one is just a little um, article on best practices for planning from home. So it can show you some of the things we touched on, but also just kind of let you know uh, some of the best ways to make sure you're keeping that routine at home and some tips as far as like, what should I be worried about right now? And just remembering that we're all in this together. Um, staying home right now is definitely the best option as much as it may seem like craziness. Um, there are ways to make it work. And then, oops, sorry, our next one is CNN 10. So we have it linked here. This is a amazing um, unbiased student news source. Um, so if you do want your kids to be informed, but you're worried about, you know, what could come up on the daily news, um, this is something we watch in our classroom every single day. So every day your child may even be familiar with it, um, but it's also great for adults. Um, and you could watch this easily as a family. It's 10 minutes. You could start off your day with this and then um, be able to discuss kind of what's going on, but it's also in a kid-friendly way. Um, then here is just a printable daily planner page. If you um, are that type of person who wants to have everything written down, and you want to kind of have um, each person go through something. So it has a little spot where you can say what you're grateful for, things that must get done today, and then things that maybe are continual items. So that's another thing we have on here. There are those continual to-do list items that seem to never go off your to-do list. And then there are the things you absolutely have to get done. And it's really important to differentiate between the two. So maybe you have to get a certain work assignment done but the continual is going through your clothes or going through the garage. Um, and you wanna be sure that you're differentiating between those. Um, then we have here linked um, our actual student schedule. So this is what we are pushing out in our classroom. And um, just in case you guys didn't have something and you wanted something to base off of, you're welcome to make a copy of this and modify it to uh, whatever works for your own family. So you can kind of look through this 
Um, we have exercise embedded, some mindfulness, some meditation, and then um, small activities and challenges for each subject. So the second, that's kind of the, the big chunk of things, um, and that's all about the structure. And the second part is flow. So once you have that structure in, how are you going to ensure that it's sustainable and that it's going to continue to flow on? Uh, so there should be a natural flow once you have those structures in place, but to ensure that it uh, continues to be sustainable and continues flowing, uh, there are three things we're going to kind of hone in on. So one, breaks, two, check-ins, three, positivity. So um, on this slide, you can see that breaks are essential to being productive and you need to schedule breaks throughout the day. And um, Olga is going to talk a little bit about um, a technique that she studied when she was in college um, that we actually get to use in our classroom and that she can use at home as well. That might be really beneficial for all ages. So for the whole family. Awesome. Thanks, Lauren. So um, I think the first graphic that I want to show you is a little middle one with the goldfish. Um, so over the course of time, uh, history shows and research shows that the attention span of a human has been drastically decreasing. So we started with a, an attention span for, of 12 seconds. And then as we get closer to the 2000s, uh, especially 2020, that attention span has dropped to eight seconds, which is actually lower than that of a goldfish. And so when we are asking people as to why their attention span is decreasing, research again shows that it's because they're distracted by technology and their, and their screen time, which is very ironic given that we're in this distance learning phase and we have to be using technology mindfully. But I think the question is, is how are you using it? And so this next piece that I want to share with you is something called the pom Pomodoro effect or technique. And it's named after the, the little tomato. So not the sauce, but the actual timer that the person who invented technique used to track his progress. And so the Pomodoro technique breaks down your tasks into intervals. And there are four rounds, but something happens after each round. And I'm going to go over that right now. So the very first thing that you need to do is to identify the task what is it specifically that you are going to be working on? So let's say if I'm a student, I need to write an essay for my teacher. Okay, great. So that's going to take a long time, but you're going to break it down. So the first thing is to identify it. The second thing is to set up, uh, set a timer of 25 minutes. If you don't have this little tomato timer, that's totally okay. You can buy it on Amazon, um, but you can use anything from a kitchen oven to um, your cell phone. But the goal again is to not get distracted if you are using the cell phone timer. Then the next thing is to work on that task for 25 minutes. After you do the 25 minutes, it does not matter if you're not finished with the task, you must take a five minute break. Uh, and the five minutes has to be five minutes. So you take the drink of water, you maybe check your cell phone in that time, check social media, that can be your break, that's fine. But once that five minutes is over, you're going to go back into the routine and then you're going to do the same thing for four more rounds. So a 25 minute work interval, five minute break. The only difference, and you'll see that on the graphic, is that once you get to that last round, your break is no longer just five minutes. Your break is going to be for 15 to 30 minutes. That's a much better break to eat, um, maybe talk to some of your family members, check in on everyone else. But that's the cycle that you're going to repeat. And research shows extensively that if you follow this technique, and we actually use this in brain science and learning, you are expected to achieve the results. Yeah. Thank you, Olga. Um, we've also linked some amazing brain breaks for kids that kind of gets them up and moving. Um, meditation, we're, we're doing meditation Mondays for our students, um, but meditation and mindfulness right now during this time, hugely beneficial, a, a great way to break. And then obviously any sort of exercise you can do is, is super beneficial to your overall health, your mindset, um, which obviously leads to um, greater productivity. Um, so the next thing is check-ins, and then I'll throw it over to Olga again. Um, but check-ins, you want to keep accountability and support flowing within your household. So each person is working, they're each in their space, they have the structures, and they have their daily lists. Um, but you need to check in with each other, okay, because not everyone is perfect, and it's not going to work every single time. Uh, so someone, and we kind of suggest maybe having different people for each hour or a different person per day or per week, however your family dynamic might work. Um, but sharing responsibility is hugely important. So maybe your five-year-old child 
is going around and doing a productivity check. Uh, maybe she sets a little timer to do that every hour, or every two hours. And she's gonna check to see if people are being productive. And so if each family member is being productive, that's awesome. If not, she's gonna give some redirection. And it's important that redirection's not always coming from parents to kids during this time, but it's also coming from kids to parents, just to kind of have that balance in the household, because um, they're not used to being home all day, all together. And it can be overwhelming to keep feeling like um, it's a one-way feedback. Um, next is you want to check for signs of anxiety. So if you're seeing any signs of anxiety for anyone in your family, so maybe your kids are having anxiety about not being able to go to school or having to work from home or not being able to see their friends, you want to break and talk about it because anxiety only builds on itself. It does not go away on its own. Um, we have tons of structures in schools that help with this and now your child is not able to access that. So you want to be sure you're taking breaks and talking but not only for your kids, but for each other, for you and your spouse or whoever it is that you may um, share a home with. Uh, adults have a whole another list of things that they could be anxious about right now. And if you're spending a whole day um, anxious, your productivity is not gonna be high. It's gonna be super low and it's likely gonna continue to be that way for a while. Um, and then the last thing is to look for any sort of positive encouragement opportunities. So if you see that your 10 year old is crushing it and he just finished everything that was on his list, he did the Pomodoro technique, he finished four rounds and is now on his 30 minute break, make sure you shout them out for that. Um, you don't want all your interactions to be negative. And while we're probably a lot of us are stressed and busy at home, uh, we wanna be sure we're adding in as much positivity as possible. Um, and that kind of leads us to the next point that Olga is going to cover. Yeah, thanks, Lauren. Um, it's kind of hard to be productive with a negative mindset. And that leads me to this quote right here that you see under the sunshine. Believing in negative thoughts is the single greatest obstruction to success. Um, yeah, it's hard to achieve results when you're always thinking about how you're not going to achieve results. Um, and so when we think about positivity, it's also not something that we can just switch on and off. If we did, then the world would be a much easier and better place. Uh, so positivity is something that has to be earned. And um, also positivity correlates and it's specifically linked to two chemical reactions that occur in your brain. And that's your levels of dopamine and uh, serotonin. So the two of those, um, we have a brain filled with um, millions and millions of nerve cells. And so when we look at those nerve cells, there's chemical reactions that happen from one to the other. And as we want to raise dopamine and serotonin naturally, we have to think about what specific ways we can do that. And there's a couple that uh, research backs up and says that, yes, that if you do these things, you will increase your levels of dopamine and ser serotonin. So the first one is exercise. That's probably the biggest one. Uh, research backs it up over and over and over again. Uh, usually they say you need to do at least 20 to 40 minutes of cardio. And the reason they say cardio is because your heart rate needs to be beating faster than what, when you are stagnant. And cardio um, related to running or jogging, something like that, um, always gives you that uh, heightened heart rate. Um, nutrition is the next thing. Um, and nutrition, not just, oh, am I eating or not eating? It's more in regards to what kind of things are you eating? Your body needs an X amount of vitamins for it to function properly. For example, vitamin C is something that we as humans were able to produce on our own and our bodies were able to pr uh, produce vitamin C and process it. But now over the course of history, we've lost that time or that ability to produce, produce vitamin C. So we're now relying for supplements or vitamins or vegetables to get that vitamin C. So it's really important that you are able to absorb that. Uh, natural light is another big thing and natural light is specifically linked to vitamin D. And some of you might have heard about the SAD disorder of when you're not receiving natural light. It's a real thing. Um, and when we're looking at it from a perspective of, of an academic lens, we actually have some research that says kids who are exposed to natural light more than others increase their reading comprehension scores as, their, as well as their math scores. Uh, so that's really important to consider because it basically says that natural light does make a big difference in our cognition and how we are running through our day. Um, sleep is another big thing. 
Uh, some people say that they, you know, can function on a much lower level of sleep than others. Um, and yes, we might have things that work better for us than others, but nonetheless, you and your kids should be sleeping. And if that means that you have to go to bed earlier, then so be it. And the reason that sleep is important, again, goes back to the brain. Um, when we are sleeping, something happens. You enter this stage, this subconscious state, where everything almost shuts down and your brain allows the spinal cord fluid to enter. And when it enters, there's specific properties in that spinal cord fluid that allows to wash out your brain of residue and toxins. And those things naturally occur when we're thinking. We naturally release toxins in the brain. But the only time that your brain can go through this uh, washing machine, per se, is when you are sleeping. And for people who are not getting that sleep, and it has to be specifically deep sleep. If you're not in deep sleep, you're not cleaning your brain of those excess things. So please make sure, like Lauren mentioned, your kids must be on a specific sleeping schedule. And there's no excuse as to why they're waking at noon, because they were going to bed at 1 a.m. That's not, that's doing harm to their bodies and to the overall routine. Um, and then the last thing is music and meditation. The reason that I link the two is because they both have similar properties. Some people don't really find music too interesting and it doesn't help them focus, whereas for me it does. Um, but other people, for example, prefer meditation instead of music, uh, but both have also been linked to uh, increased levels of dopamine and serotonin. So consider those things as you think about how you can be positive. And then the next part is the results, right? So we're doing all of these things, all of these things that Lauren mentioned in terms of structure and routine, all to achieve an outcome. And so the definition specifically of what is a result, and it's the outcome of your efforts. So in other words, so what? You did this, but did you just do it for nothing? Um, and whether we like to admit it or not, uh, we are humans who are driven by achievement. We're motivated by it. We're motivated by results. They've done studies for people who work in their, um, in their companies, uh, why some people ach achieve or perform better than others. And it's because of that results factor. And uh, results ultimately uh, measure your goals. It's, it, they tell you whether you accomplished what you wanted to accomplish or did not. And so there's different forms of results, but you can also have, find a synonym for them and they can be deliverables. They can be the product that you achieve at the end or the outcome. And so when we're thinking, um, next slide, Lauren, when we're thinking about results for you and what they may look like at home while you're working at from home, um, they actually have different shapes and forms. So I'm gonna show you the first one, the paid bill. You have an electric bill that must be paid um, and then you finally pay it. So maybe you hitting that submit button online, that's a result, that's an outcome that you achieve because you put in a certain amount of effort to get there. That's the final deliverable. Um, then it can look something else, like a send email. You have this to-do list uh, of sending an email to your coworker, you send the email. That email that's currently waiting in their inbox is the result. Um, other things like washing dishes, big pile of dishes, now they're washed, that's the result. And you can keep going and you can see all these different examples that I put for you. Uh, for your student, it could be the final essay, the dinner that's on the kitchen or the dining room table, um, that successful phone call that you just did. So all of those are examples. You can look at them um, and think about what results actually mean to you. And then the last piece of the equation, um, are the rewards. Uh, what are rewards? Rewards, well, they will propel you to sustain the good habits that you've um, been trying to create over the course of time. Uh, again, just like achievement, uh, we cannot function without rewards. And on the next slide, you'll see, uh, I, I showed and displayed a book that I read about seven years ago, and it's called The Power of Habit. It's actually a very, very famous uh, book. It's a New York Times bestseller by Charles Duhigg, and I might be pronouncing the last name wrong. But he basically coined something called the habit loop. And he says that for us to sustain good habits or bad habits, it doesn't really matter which of the habits, in our case, we want good habits, but you need to do, you're going to need to go through three stages. So you have something called the cue that triggers you to do something. Then you follow a routine and then you have the reward slash result that you obtain after you complete the habit. And the goal of all of this 
is to make something foreign and make it a behavior that we do naturally. And that's what a, a habit is, is for you to be able to do something without even thinking about it. So when we're breathing, we're doing it naturally. When we're sleeping, we're doing it naturally. When we're drinking a glass of water, we just, or we're going to the fridge, it's something that we do because we have been programmed to do it. And that's what we want to do with these um, different uh, outcomes that Lauren and I have outlined for you in this presentation. So going on to the next slide, we'll look at an example of a habit loop so that you can start formulating those good habits. And I'm going to give you a first example, the, the easiest one. And it's, for example, a mouse who's looking for uh, a piece of cheese. So the mouse has been programmed, for example, to hear a cue. Let's say it's a, it's a mouse in a cage with a scientist. So the scientist might ring the bell the mouse might hear the bell. It might go through the little labyrinth or the maze to get to the cheese, and then it will eat the cheese. So going through the cage is the routine. And then that mouse knows that there will be a reward at the end of that habit loop. And so therefore, the next time it hears the bell, it does what it's supposed to because the reward will be coming. Now, from a perspective of a human being, we're not mice, what does that look like in our daily lives? I'm going to give you two examples specifically. Uh, one is it's 5.30 p.m. You're getting ready to go home. You're exhausted and you cannot wait for uh, that relaxing moment where you can just drink a cold beer. So you end up going home, you go to the fridge, you crack open the, the beer bottle and then you take that first sip and then automatically your body gets rushed with this reward. And so happens that next Friday or next Tuesday, you end up doing the same thing because you know the reward is there at the end of that process. Um, I'm gonna set, put it over to the side and you'll see a toothbrush, a little diagram of a toothbrush. Same thing, habit loop. But this, this technique and this understanding is so profound that businesses have been using it uh, to drive their sales and to sell products through the tool of marketing. So now it's not just about the advertisement that companies are putting out there. It's about the actual product and the ability that it can create for you to feel like you're getting perhaps a fake reward. So in this case, when we look at toothpaste, we have noticed that over the course of time, companies have ha added a little twingling pigment to the toothpaste. That twingling, uh, feature has nothing to do with cleaning your teeth. It has everything to do with making you feel it so you think that your teeth are clean. And so that's the same thing happened with Lysol. Um, when they invented Lysol, they added all these properties to it for it to have that smell. And so when, for example, somebody's cleaning their house and their family member comes in and they smell that smell, they don't think, oh, that smells nice. They think, oh, this house is clean. And so when you think about yourself, you need to start understanding and establishing the rewards that will accompany the very thing that you're trying to accomplish. So on the next slide, we have kind of like a little bit of a, a, a checklist that I want you to go through mentally to think about what, what those rewards look like for you. You have to think about what motivates you. Um, if, for example, I say, well, you should have a Caesar salad at the end of your 25 minute um, work session. Well, you might say, I hate Caesar salad. That doesn't entice me at all. Why would I have a Caesar salad at the end? So that's why you have to think about what motivates you and use that as a reward mechanism. Uh, what do you crave? I love chocolate. If somebody waves chocolate in front of me, I'll do anything for it. So that's something that you can think about. Uh, what makes you excited and what is it that you're yearning so bad? those things will help you establish those rewards. Awesome. Thank you so much, Olga. Um, and that kind of sums up the four main points. So you have the, the routines and the structures, and then once you get it flowing, you have your outcomes, your deliverables, and you have your rewards as well. Um, so uh, we have a Q&A session. So if anyone has any questions, you're welcome to pop them in the chat. Um, and I know this is posted as well. So um, you may not be joining us live, but you may be watching after. Um, so I'll kind of skip down to this last one and just say you're welcome to email us if you want any more resources or if you want to connect in any way. Um, here are both of our emails and um, I believe you'll have this PowerPoint linked as well. Um, so kind of lastly, um, Olga, unless you have something else, we'll kind of go over um, the Spark and Inspire, our project that we want to share with you guys. 
um, to try to get a little bit of community engagement going and let you know what we're doing to try to strengthen communities up in Wahiwa at our school. Um, Olga, you think we're good? I think, yeah, I think we're great. Maybe you want to just go over that quickly what this Spark and Inspire initiative is and, and what are we trying to achieve here? Yeah, so um, Spark and Inspire is an event that you may or may not be familiar with. It started in Hawaii last year. Um, but it's basically, it's an event focused on innovative ideas that are driven by local educators here in Hawaii. Um, and the event showcases locally grounded education innovators who have a chance to connect with experts, that might could be you, um, any type of policy maker, any type of funding um, and decision makers in order to access networks, resources, and support to cultivate our ideas. Um, so Olga and I are actually have the honor of being one set of the three presenters at this year's Spark and Inspire event, um, which is going to be a three-day series, May 5th, 6th, and 7th, um, and our presentation is actually going to be on May 5th uh, from 4.30 to 5.30 p.m., and um, our project is an, obviously a virtual event, um, and we linked it here. So if you want to learn anything else about it, you can visit their Facebook page. Um, you can also RSVP to the event here. If this is something that interests you, you um, might be a big stakeholder in community. Maybe you're passionate um, and your community and your organization is passionate about education here specifically in Hawaii. Um, this would be a great thing for you to come to. So um, our project is called Build a Bridge, and I might throw it over to Olga to try to uh, explain a little bit about what we are trying to do up in Wahiwa and hopefully one day um, greater state of Hawaii and extend it to other islands as well. Yep, awesome. Thank you, Lauren. Um, so uh, our project is very unique, and it specifically services the community that we're in. So we mentioned that we're teachers, um, but we're teachers of a very special uh, body of students. Most of our students are military impacted, and we're actually uh, operating on a military base. And so just physically looking at our community, you can see the barrier, the physical barrier between the military community and the greater community of Wahiwa. And so in Wahiwa also, there's another middle school called Wahiwa Middle School that predominantly services a local community. And for the longest time, ever since the military occupation in Hawaii, we've been having this gap between um, the military population and the local population. We believe that both groups have so much to learn from each other, especially students from our school who end up leaving later on for their next deployment or their parents' rotation. But we feel like there's so many Hawaiian values and some of those values are embedded in the HA framework that the state has created for all schools. Uh, but we want our kids to be able to take these values with them and share it with the greater population to whatever location that they go next. And so through this initiative, we're going to have students from Wahiwa Middle and students from Wheeler Middle School get together and try to solve community issues. And they're going to use a, a framework, those Hawaiian intrinsic values that we might see here in the landscape to drive the change within their community. So they're going to have to build those relationships, uh, share experiences, and try to work together to achieve greater outcomes. And part of the reason that we're doing it is because we notice that our school lacks this sense of belonging. They don't have this attachment to their land and their surroundings. And so we wanted to change that. Um, and partially also because, uh, again, research shows that kids who create or achieve outcomes later on are the kids that are engaged. And so this is a way for kids to use that inquiry lens that Lauren mentioned earlier in our teaching philosophy to be curious beings about their surroundings and to make a difference in their world. So together, they're going to do that throughout the community. And so I cannot stress the importance of meeting and your presence at this event because we're trying to get uh, perspectives from different stakeholders so that this can be a successful venture for uh, many years down the line. So we're super eager uh, to hear from you, to hear your feedback and for you to attend the actual event. Yeah, we would love to connect with you. So again, you can see our emails um, linked on the next slide um, and we would just love to hear your thoughts and ideas on our project um, or if you feel like you have ways we could network or um, 
even just benefit from a mutual partnership would be awesome. Um, we also were able to be featured on a podcast, part one of three. Uh, so if you're interested in just hearing more from us, more of a perspective on teaching here in Hawaii, um, you can check that out here as well. Um, but this kind of wraps up um, everything that we had prepared for you guys. We hope that it can help um, maneuver and help navigate through this crazy time. Um, we totally understand uh, everybody working from home uh, presents a lot of challenges, but we are just kind of sharing what some of the things we use in our own classrooms and things we've discovered from teaching on how, how to best structure learning for, uh, you know, 60 kids at a room at a time isn't, isn't so easy either. So um, we want to share what we know with you guys and try to give back in that way. Um, so thank you so much for having us, and uh, we hope to connect with you. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. guys. Um... That was so awesome. I had some questions, but that was incredibly thorough. Um, all the graphics and everything were super impressive. So thank you so much. Uh, one little thing that I was wondering is, have parents um, shared much about struggles they've had so far with all of this? And uh, what is, yeah, what are some of the trends that you're seeing with that? And I'm sure most of the parents of the kids have jobs, right? So they. They are kind of the audience that we're focusing on. Um, yeah, and how do you, like, are they finding that the tools that you're giving have been successful? Like, what are just some conversations you're having with the parents, I guess? Yeah, I can hop on that one, Olga, if you want. Um, uh, I would say the biggest piece of feedback, um, every Monday we just split it up and we call all 60 of our kids. So I take 30 and Olga takes 30. So we're at least connecting once a week on the phone with their family, um, if not more than that. So. Um, the biggest trend I've seen, and Olga, you can chime in too, is that um, having a bunch of kids um, all at the same time at home and not having enough devices for um, everybody to be working on at the same time. So the kids are all working on different things. It's hard to keep it all straight um, is kind of the biggest thing. So parents are having a hard time of like, okay, I have a third grader who needs to do this, but I got a fifth grader who needs to do this. And I have a preschooler who I need my high schooler to look after. Um, and so the high schooler is not able to get their work done. Um, and, and we definitely believe that um, the things that we've shared with you guys here um, can definitely help to combat some of that, not saying it's going to be perfect, um, but having structures and systems in place to where maybe they're taking turns on the, you know, device while taking turns watching the little one, taking turns doing things around the house. Um, kids can be a huge asset and we, we use them a lot in our classroom. We have classroom jobs where they, they do different things around the house. So um, we're hoping to just frame it in a way where, where kids are not just like an addition to your home right now and they're home all day. Uh, you're learning how to kind of utilize all the bodies in your house to get more things done. Um, but that's a huge struggle that I've heard a lot about. Olga, I don't know if you've heard a different trend or want to add on to that. Yeah, I can add on and I can kind of tackle it from two perspectives. Um, the first one is the data. Uh, so we, we have weekly meetings, even sometimes bi-weekly meetings with our co-teachers and so across all grade levels. And we've noticed that those teachers are not getting the engagement from their kids as we have. And then Lauren and I kind of reflected and thought about why, how come our students are performing better or more than other students in the school. And part of that reason is because of the structure. So we have created a very stringent structure all throughout the day. And we make sure that all of our parents know explicitly what it is that we're looking and what kids need to accomplish. Now we have found, there's a little caveat to that. We found that um, parents who are not successful with that is, or are the parents who kind of take that a little bit for granted. So what I mean by that is they'll, they'll know what the child has to do and they'll assume that the child did it. And then when we check and the child did, actually did not do it. And then when we jump on the call with them, they'll say something like, oh, I thought they did do it because I asked them, did they do it? And they said, yeah. And although this might be the ideal circumstance where you're assigning something to your child and they, you know, they go ahead and do it because they're independent learners, the reality of it is that 
that's not always the case. So my advice to parents is not to take their child's response as is, but to actually go into the computer or into the assignment and see, did they in fact do it or did they not? And if they didn't, then you probably should have a conversation about with them about that and actually physically sit next to them to show them that you are part of this entire process and that their success is dependent on your success. So that's, I think, an important piece there. Yeah, I love that. I think that it's interesting to look at all of this as like, it's a group effort, right? Like how can, how can you help your kids so that they help you during to succeed in your work? How can you, you know, vice versa? Um, yeah, it's super interesting because a lot of our members, they do have, actually, I mean, it's kind of like split. Like some of them have uh, families, others don't, but um, a lot of our members have a lot younger kids. So they're not totally into like, actual distance learning yet um which honestly i go back and forth with is that easier or harder you know if you have a six-year-old they can't like they don't have the attention span to like really be entertained by themselves um but yeah i think all these tools are still super helpful and i'm so appreciative of your guys's time um i'll be sure to share the contact information and everything at the end as well and share that out i did get a text from two members saying they could make the live one. So the recording will be awesome. Um, yeah. And anything else you guys have to add later, we can always come back around to, but I really appreciate this and we'll help with your little side project too. That's so awesome. I can't wait to listen to the podcast. Awesome. Thank you Thanks. so much for having us. Yeah. So great. Um,